Good afternoon. Thank you for joining our webinar. Uh, let's maybe wait for just um, for a while to allow all people to dial in because they are still joining the webinar. Uh, I will go on mute and we will be back with you shortly. Okay, let's start. Uh, my name is Evgenia Firsova, and I'm Commodities Proposition Manager at Refinitiv in Emerging and Frontier Markets. I'm glad to welcome you uh, to this webinar that will cover oil and gas markets in Southern Africa. Before we begin, uh, let me say several words about the platform that we are using today. First of all, the webinar is recorded, and we will email the recording and the slide decks to all registrants and attendees after the webinar. Uh, please note for, that for the best experience, uh, we recommend closing any browser sessions running in the background. And if you see that uh, your slides are behind, please use F5 on your keyboard to refresh your page. Uh, we definitely encourage you to interact with us. You can see on your screen there are several widgets. Uh, they are movable and resizable. One of these widgets is a box that is called Q&A. Here you can submit your questions, and we encourage you to submit these questions because at the end of the webinar, we'll have a session, Q&A session, where we will go through these questions. And I hope we'll have enough time to, uh, to, to review all these questions and to answer all these questions. In the next hour, we will provide an overview of the oil and gas market uh, with specific focus on LNG projects. But before I introduce our first speaker, Mohamed Yasser, our oil analyst uh, representing a Refinitiv Research and Forecast team, uh, I'd like to say several words about this team. Uh, as you probably know, uh, Refinitiv uh, is uh, one of the largest providers of financial markets data and infrastructure. And one of our top priorities uh, is commodities market coverage. Uh, Refinitiv has a dedicated uh, research and forecast team um, that is a big team uh, of more than 160 commodities analysts. Uh, they are acknowledged industry experts, professionals uh, that are using sophisticated proprietary modeling and forecasting techniques to analyze supply, demand, prices, and visualize flows to help you better understand what is going where and when. Uh, and so we can view uh, historical and forward-looking aggregate oil flows and, for example, uh, track LNG vessels. Uh, and now I'd like to hand over to Mohamed Yasser, our first speaker. The floor is yours, Mohamed. Thank you, Ghania. Thanks for the introduction. I would like to thank everybody who's joined in for the webinar today. So today, I would like to give an outlook on the Southern Africa outlook market. And by that, uh, I would like to cover the crude market initially. So give a quick overview on that. And then uh, go head on to the clean products, followed by the clean, pro clean product market in Southeast Africa, in, sp in specific uh, regards to the flows which come in to the region, and then uh, ended up with the freight market development. So before I head to the crude section, I'd like to start off with some uh, estimates which IMS, IMF has provided for 2020. So 2020 projects the world out, output to contract by 4.9%. And in the same line, all other major economies are set to contract as well. The trend is kind of uh, continued for uh, South uh, for Sahara, Sub-Sahara Africa as well, with Nigeria and South Africa reporting around 5.4 to 
8%. So with the worst economic outlook in, say, in decades, we, we sure expect to have an impact on uh, crude demand and prices as well, and which can be clearly seen in the next uh, slide here. So if you have showed me this slide, say, next uh, last year, sometime this time last year, I would think to myself, what on earth really went wrong? So, well, it has been that kind of a year. The Brent uh, started off the year somewhere around the $70 uh, per, per, per barrel mark. But with uh, China uh, soon after that announcing the country was facing a pandemic issue, the prices started to crumble. The COVID uh, spread to the rest of the world in no time and which again dragged the prices down. The second blow actually came out when OPEC plus production agreement kind of fell apart. So Saudi and Russia had a disagreement in terms of the future uh, production cuts, and this led to a total uh, uh, fallout on uh, OPEC plus. So when the prices crumbled even further, OPEC plus took note of this and kind of met and re-agreed on a new product production deal, which brought about a major reduction in crude oil production. And along with voluntary cuts, which was announced by Saudi, UAE, and Kuwait, the prices started to recover. So Brent recovered and enjoyed a phase of recovery for a few months. But uh, come September, the prices uh, sort of uh, came down. So the steam from the OPEC plus was actually waning off because of the resurgence of the new COVID cases uh, in the globe. As the new records were set with new cases and also deaths, and this brought about a bleak uh, demand outlook for the future. And uh, along with the other market conditions such as cyclones in, uh, in in the U.S. kind of gave a bit of a price, but again, we still are somewhere around $41 uh, dollar as we speak right now. So OPEC Plus did uh, help uh, recover a bit of uh, the prices in Brent. And uh, two countries which specifically were uh, affected in the southern part of Africa in terms of the OPEC agreement, uh, Angola and Gabon. So Angola, as you can see on the left side of the slide here, the exports kind of dropped soon after the agreement came into uh, effect. But as per the latest uh, reports for September, Angola produced just about uh, 1.27 million barrels, but they had a limit of only 1.25 million barrels. So they did overproduce for September. In terms of uh, Gabon, we saw the exports uh, to be erratic, and the compliance has not been great with Gabon as well. As for uh, September, they produced around 200 uh, barrels per day, 200,000 barrels per day, compared to the limit of 160,000 barrels per day. So either of these countries, such as Angola and Gabon, have not uh, given out a, a roadmap on how they uh, look in the future to reduce the production like the other uh, African countries, uh, which have also overproduced, have provided this month when the OPEC meeting took place uh, earlier this month. Before I head on to the clean products, I, I want to speak quickly about the UAE and the Saudi Arabia crude grades and yield. As you will see in the further flights, UAE and Saudi are one of the top uh, suppliers uh, for uh, oil products for Southeast Africa. So the crudes uh, which uh, UAE and Saudi uh, man, uh, produce it plays an important role in their refining uh, activity. So in terms of UAE, they have grades from heavy, medium, and low, light, I mean. And then for Saudi Arabia, they also have heavy, medium, and light grades along with a sweeter light grade as well. The UAE and Saudi Arabian refineries are quite advanced, and this sort of helps them to maximize yield out of their uh, heavy uh, crude grades. So Saudi Arabia prefers to use their Arab heavy for refining, 
because of the sophistication of uh, refineries which they have in the country, which lets them to take out maximum yield out of uh, uh, the Harab heavy grade. And in turn, they prefer selling their Arab light and Arab medium to other countries, which usually fetch a better uh, price in the market. Uh, whereas for UAE, UAE usually uses uh, Marbon, its flagship uh, crude grade, uh, for their refining uh, activity. So the table on the left for uh, UAE Marbon, it basically gives out the breakdown of how uh, the yield would be for a, one, for a barrel of crude in terms of the oil products, which would basically be refined out of it. And the table on the right gives you a perspective of how Arab heavy, Arab light, and Arab medium would yield in terms of the oil products. So next up, I'd like to speak about the clean products. And let me start off with the middle distillates, which have had a very bad year for this year. As you can see, the swaps have been in contango right from the start of this year. Jet specifically has had a very uh, bad year because of the COVID uh, uh, effects in the economy globally. As we all know, it, all the flights globally were grounded because of uh, the pandemic. The same can be seen in gas oil as well. The swaps remaining in contango right from the beginning uh, so of the pandemic and still remains there. There was a knock-on effect from uh, JET as a lot of refiners pushed and tried to produce as much as gas oil possible from the barrel instead of JET, just, just for the fact that JET was really giving out a bad margin and gas oil was a little better off. But this led to an increase in supply in the market and hence we see gas oil also continuing to remain in contango. The cracks here, the two charts really give out a picture of how bad it has been for uh, jet and gas oil as well in terms of uh, cracks. They have weakened quite substantially as compared to the fire range. So if you see for jet here, it actually went down to close to minus five in week 19, which which is not seen say in the past five years, although it still remains somewhere close to the uh, bottom, but we do, we do see a bit of a recovery of late. Gas oil as well, although not as bad as uh, jet, it has faced a lot of uh, issues in the in the market with uh, oversupply and less demand because of COVID again. But like I mentioned, there has been recovery lately as the lockdown in a lot of uh, countries have been eased. And also for jet, since the winter has just started, uh, the use of jet and kerosene uh, for uh, heating purpose has picked up slightly. The stocks pretty much give out the same picture as Contango sustains in the economy. We see the stocks to be on the higher end continuously. For uh, middle distillates, on the left, you see the Fujera middle distillate storage inventory. It has been pretty much high uh, week, out, week, out, week in, week out for in terms of uh, when compared to the three-year range. And also, the Singapore middle distillate storage on the right clearly shows that there has been a steady increase in supply or in storage uh, in, in, in Singapore. So now moving into the light distillates, the picture here looks a little better off. The year started off uh, with, uh, or with the pandemic, when the pandemic started off, the Light distillates also were in contango for a, for a long time and then slowly moved on, specifically for uh, gasoline and recovered. But whereas for NAFTA, it strengthened quite a bit. And as you can see uh, off late, it is in a clear backwardation as we speak. And it has gained a lot of demand from the pet petrochemical sector and has performed fairly better and the best performing oil product, uh, in fact. Gas gasoline has also performed fairly better, and at least compared to the middle distillates. 
with um, a bit of demand coming in um, a, a, as uh, lockdown eases across the globe. The cracks give you a better picture here as how the recovery has been. As you can see, both NAFTA and gasoline had a V-shaped recovery in Asia. One of the main reasons is because Asia was uh, in a better place to deal with the pandemic and come out of it, powered by China in specific. So on the left chart, you can see that NAFTA cracks actually improved and are right now in multi-year high. They have performed considerably good because of the fact that there has been a increase in demand from petrochemical sector because of increase in use of uh, personal protective equipment and also single-use plastics. So that has really boosted uh, NAFTA cracks uh, in, in Asia, and it still remains quite strong. Gasoline, although not as strong as um, NAFTA, but it is closer to the fire range, and of late we has found uh, good uh, support in terms of uh, a lot of economies coming out of lockdown, especially in countries such as Philippines, Indonesia, the demand has been fairly good. In terms of the stock for light distillates, the Fujera light distillate storage on the left side was kind of range bound, but higher on few of the weeks, but in range with uh, the three year range for the others, but has been uh, fairly range bound uh, for uh, uh, light distillates in Fujera. But whereas in Singapore, we do see a lot of supply and hence the storage has been quite uh, high uh, above, above the fire range for uh, Singapore light distillate storage. Now moving on to the clean market in uh, Southeast Africa. So Southeast uh, African countries are more or less an import driven uh, country. So they import all their oil products uh, from elsewhere. Specifically, they import a lot of uh, gas oil and uh, gasoline with a little bit of uh, jet, which can be clearly seen in these slides here. So starting off with uh, Kenya imports, the imports in 2019 were higher than it has been for 2020, as you can clearly see on the pie on the left side. The demand has been a lower because of the COVID issues. The average for 2019 is just around 249,000 metric tons, whereas compared to 2020, it was around 324 uh, average on a monthly basis. The top uh, suppliers being UAE, Saudi and India, which remains the same in 2020 as well. Uh, a point to note here is the UAE storage or UAE supplies um, actually consists of uh, shipments out of Fujera storage as well. So that's the case for the for this chart and the next few slides as well. In terms of gasoline, again, the 2020 uh, imports were lesser than compared to 2019. The 2020 monthly average was around 155,000 metric tons compared to 170,000 metric tons in 2019. Jet uh, imports uh, average just about uh, 69,000 metric tons for 2020. In terms of uh, Tanzania imports, you can see that 2019 was again slightly above than 2020, although by not much as the difference was just around uh, 10, 10 to uh, 12,000 uh, metric tons. So average for 2020 was just around 233,000. In terms of gasoline, however, we did see an increase in uh, gasoline imports for 2020 compared to 2019, with a lot of it coming out of uh, UAE. In terms of uh, jet imports, uh, for 2020, it is uh, average around a um, monthly average of around 45,000 metric tons. And moving on to Mozambique, the imports uh, in 2020 and 2019 have been fairly equal, around just around 225,000 metric tons, a, a slightly slightly lesser for uh, uh, 2019, but not by too much. The top uh, suppliers being India, UAE, and uh, Bahrain, the same for 2020 and 2019. In terms of the gasoline uh, imports, there was a substantial increase in imports for 2020, 2020 uh, 
main reason is Mozambique acts as a re-exporting hub for uh, its neighboring landlocked countries such as Zimbabwe, Zambia, Malawi, and Eastern DRC. So this brought about an increase uh, from, from uh, as there was an increase in demand from these uh, countries of post the lockdown uh, restrictions, this kind of led to increase in imports into Mozambique as well. On in, on terms of the jet uh, imports, they were just around 10,000 metric tons uh, for 2020. In terms of the South Africa imports, the gas oil imports for 2020 were higher uh, than compared to 2019. One of the reasons was in Q3, we saw a substantial increase in import as, uh, as, as restrictions of lockdown actually came down for, uh, uh, in, in South Africa after the government eased uh, failed the restrictions, the demand uh, increased. And uh, the suppliers uh, for uh, gas oil for South Africa were India, Oman, and UAE for 2020. In terms of the gasoline imports, they were, uh, they were fairly equal for both the years, 2020 and 2019. We just, uh, we, 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 we saw an average of 112,000 metric tons for uh, 2020. And uh, the jet uh, average is, is, is somewhere around just about 30,000 metric tons for the, 20, for the year 2020 as well. So well, finally, the freight rates. So freight rates of late have been... Uh, stable as the demand uh, in, in in the global in a global uh, outlook is kind of quite low but as you see here in the chart in the month of uh, april and may there was a substantial increase in freight rates the reason for this was when the market was in contango during this time the demand for floating storage was uh, was 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 receiving a lot of um, uh, demand in, in the market, which kind of uh, increased the freight rates as well, along with it. So the freight rates were high for for a good month or two, but after the demand outlook in the in, in the in the world was looking bleak, the prices did come come off. But however, the floating storage safe in this example in the north north northwest Europe still remain consistent or more or less, but uh, the Freight rates have come down because the demand globally has suffered quite a bit. So before I end my presentation, I would just like to point out a few events to look out for. So in near and medium term, a cure for the virus and uh, and the economic recovery, how that would really impact and how fast the world, uh, the world actually recovers from the downward trend which we have uh, faced this, this year. And the next point is also where OPEC uh, has uh, their other members work in terms of compliance and also what future actions they take in to keep uh, the, uh, the market in check. The next point is the U.S. elections. As we know, the two president candidates have different outlook as to how they want to deal with, uh, with their uh, fossil uh, fuel um, in the future. And also the sanctions which we have currently say on Iran or Venezuela as well, and how long or if at all it will uh, remain in place going forward. And finally, the new refineries which are bound to come in Jizan and Dukum, Jizan being just a few months away, the start of 2021, will also be an important point to look out for. In terms of uh, long-term uh, perspective, climate change, which right now everybody is taking it really seriously as time goes by, would really have any impact on how the future market for oil would pan out. And we also we already see the investments being affected because of this as major uh, oil companies have already trimmed down their investments into fossil fuel energy projects and looking into a cleaner uh, fuel uh, supplement as well. So in terms of uh, uh, disruption of transport uh, industry as well, as more and more vehicles are moving into battery-operated that battery operated uh, instead of fuel. And finally, the evolution of chemical industry, as we have seen clearly, that uh, uh, the refiners who had or who were refining chemicals uh, were in a better place in terms of margins as they were getting better uh, output from the, from, from the barrel of the crude. And by that, I come to an end and I'll hand it over to Harmana.
Thank you, uh, thank you, Mohammed. Um, and I'd like uh, to remind our participants uh, that you can submit your questions in the Q and A widget, and we will get back to these questions at the end of the session. So at any time, you can submit your questions. Uh, and now I'd like to invite our next speaker, Hermano Giovanni. Uh, Hermano is head of oil and gas at EPSA Bank Mozambique. He has previously worked in other sectors such as agriculture, business, consumer, and diversified industrials. So welcome, Hermano. Please over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Venya, uh, for, for having me on, on the presentation. And also thank you very much, Mohammed, uh, for providing insights um, for, for, the oil, for the oil sector um, across different regions. So, um, uh, you know, Venya did very well in introduce myself. Uh, so I'm representing APSA Bank uh, Mozambique. Uh, so before I do move on to the different slides in the presentation, I'd just like to briefly highlight um, the role that we do play as, as a bank um, in, in the oil and gas sector here in Mozambique. So first of all, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be speaking from a different perspective. So Mohammed, Mohammed did briefly highlight um, the, the import demands for fuels in Mozambique and how Mozambique also re-exports to neighboring countries. Um, I'll be speaking more from uh, the, the LNG project perspective, as uh, we do have two projects in Mozambique that have been sanctioned um, in recent years. Um, I'll, I'll be providing details on those recently, and I'll pretty much be touching on uh, the status of those projects, uh, the type of opportunities that should emerge uh, for clients of different sectors in terms of works that can be done under those projects, and what the overall outlook is uh, for Mozambique. Another point I'd like to briefly highlight is the role that we play as a bank. Uh, so it's pretty much uh, twofold. So on one hand, uh, we are fortunate to be one of the um, largest commercial banks that are playing the biggest role in terms of the, the project finance. So there was quite, uh, quite a bit of noise on the press around uh, middle 2020. When I say no noise, I mean positive noise. Uh, there, there were a lot of headlines around um, Mozambique LNG project being able to secure um, over $15 billion of, of financing from commercial banks and export credit agencies, the ECAs. So we happen to be the second largest commercial banking lender on the project. So we do have a commitment of um, $300 million. So as per the status of the project, uh, the financial close is expected to happen uh, by the 1st of November, um, provided all things do, do go according to plan. So, so moving forward, um, I'll be touching a bit on uh, who the key players are in Mozambique, as I do believe that um, a significant portion of the audience are people who might not be very familiar with the, with the landscape here in Mozambique. So there pretty much um, are around four key projects in Mozambique that, um, that are making better headlines. So the oldest one being, being the project in, in Sazal. Uh, so, so that's around uh, in Yamban region. Uh, for some, for those who don't are not very familiar with the Mozambican geography, that's around the central region. So this particular project, um, you know, the, the 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 contract with the government between uh, Sasol um, was signed around the year 2000, 2000, and 2004 was when the LNG production did, did begin for this. So we're talking about a block of around 2.9 trillion uh, cubic feet, and the gas is exported to, to South Africa. So South African economy is pretty much the key, the key off ticket for that. And obviously with the COVID situation, we've seen that um, South Africa has been one of the economies hit the hardest. Um, at some point, in terms of the number of cases, South Africa didn't rank at number five. So that automatically does have a very uh, negative impact on the economy, and therefore the demand for um, LNG coming from Mozambique. So there also have been recent headlines on Sazal uh, going to market to sell some of the assets. And um, there are some commercial banks that are involved in the buy and sell side of the transaction. Uh, then moving up, um, the projects that have been making a lot of headlines uh, around the Rovuma Basin. So, th so those are the projects in northern Mozambique and Cabo Delgado province. So on one hand, you have um, the Mozambique LNG Area 1 project, mostly known as Area 1. Um, the operation is led by Total, formerly on Adarco. They do have the other concessionaires, such as, you know, the Mozambican NOC, um, ENH. You have the likes of Mitsui, ONGC, as the other partners for the project. Um, second, and this project was, was sanctioned around uh, June 2019. And the sanctioning value, or rather the investment value for this, is somewhere around $25 uh, billion U.S. dollars. Um, during the... Um, 
FID sanctioning ceremony that did happen in June 2019. Uh, the, in the same event, uh, the contract with the EPC company was signed. Uh, so it was formerly a joint venture between CBNI, Chiod, and Saipem. And now it's a joint venture between Saipem and McDermott, and that was an $8 billion contract. And then secondly, you have um, the MRV project, which is uh, the uh, uh, MRV Mozambique Ruma venture. That's a joint venture between Exxon Mobil, uh, Italy's ENI, and also CNPC from China. Uh, so in this particular project, um, uh, Exxon Mobil is pretty much the delegated uh, midstream operator for the project. So pretty much the LNG plant project will be managed and constructed uh, by them. Then you have ENI, which is um, the upstream uh, delegated operator, and the upstream the, up, the upstream structure will be developed by them. And also due to the the pandemic situation. Um, uh, Mohammed also did highlight how the pandemic has impacted the oil and gas sector worldwide. So what did happen is due to the reduction in industrial activity in a lot of markets, um, and also consequently the reduction in, in domestic consumption of, of fuels as a result of um, a drop in, in, unemploy in employment, uh, there has been a very drastic capital expenditure cut worldwide in the oil sector. A lot of um, independent oil companies have really cut back on investment uh, plans. Um, some of them did, did also cancel or postpone expansion plans. So we're talking about a total CapEx cut of $60 billion in total, and that amount did rise a bit above $70 billion around uh, Q3 of this year. So obviously, the sub-Saharan African region did get impacted very, very, very drastically. So initially, in the beginning of the year, prior to the pandemic um, hitting the globe, well, or rather hitting Southern Africa, uh, the initial view was that you know MRV would be sanctioning their FID, and we're talking about amounts around uh, thirty billion dollars. So um, that has been pushed back, and there is still a bit of uncertainty as to when exactly that's likely to happen. There have been headlines speculating 2021 and others speculating years after that, even though there is no, there is no certain uh, uh, timeline for that. So that means that Mozambique in itself did really get, get impacted with a $30 billion of um, investment or reduction as a result of this. So for the MRV project, we have um, JFT, the uh, EPC company, which is a joint venture between uh, Japan's uh, JGC Corporation, uh, Floor, and also Technip, which, which um, did sign a, a contract in the pre-FID ceremony that did happen last year. And obviously, the actual amount of the EPC contract is still unconfirmed. Um, I do assume that that would be confirmed around the time when the actual FID is signed. And thirdly, we have um, the Coral FLNG project, which is 100% um, owned by, by ENI. So this is a project uh, where the floating um, FLNG vessel was uh, is, is being constructed. So the FIDs for this particular project was sanctioned in 2017, and we're talking about an investment amount of around $8 billion uh, U.S. dollars. And for this particular project, uh, the single um, off-taker for it is, is BP, and the off-take agreement was signed around 2016-2017. Uh, That's where it was announced. And that did really give a lot of comfort to proceed with, with the investment decision. So looking at the, the overall status of, of the, the projects in Mozambique, um, just by looking at the economy as a whole, um, as Ivania did mention, I have been exposed to different sectors. Um, with the whole pandemic, we have seen that a lot of sectors have been hit really hard, which are the same traditional sectors that have been impacted around the globe, such as your entertainment, such as your leisure and the hospitality sectors. On the other hand, you do have sectors such as consumer sector in Mozambique and also agriculture that are kind of benefiting to some extent. Because on one hand, um, the local government is really pushing for um, the, the retailers and distributors of consumable goods to source agricultural inputs locally and in agricultural crops. On the other hand, <clears throat> with borders being closed um, post the pandemic, a lot of the consumers are resorting to consuming uh, goods domestically as they do, do not have any more choice of you know shopping and buying stuff um, offshore. That has been reduced quite drastically. So pretty much um, the Coral FLNG project um, since since the, the the pandemic did come during a, during a time 
well, when the project was an in investment and development phase, uh, as well as the, the Total's Mozambique LNG project, uh, these two projects end up being the life support uh, for the Mozambican economy. So the view is still that even though the forecast of economic growth and a lot of economic indicators have been revised post-COVID, uh, the view is still that the LNG sector is going to have a very positive impact um, in the Mozambican economy. So this slide here does um, give a brief overview of uh, the status of, of the projects in Mozambique, and it does to a high extent point to um, where the opportunities would be in terms of uh, you know, companies that, that would be looking at uh, securing uh, some contracts either directly with the EPC companies or even uh, tier three or contracts even further downstream um, in, in order to supply goods and services to, to the project value chain. So on one hand, we do have um, onshore, onshore activity happening in the projects. So for example, we have on, on the Afungi site, which is the man camp, we, we do see the man camp construction that's taking place. Um, uh, uh, quite massive contracts have been awarded and quite significant activity is taking place. Uh, we have seen that the airstrip has been constructed and also roads are being developed in different phases. Um, we also have seen that um, while the actual construction of the LNG plant is scheduled to happen somewhere between uh, Q2 or Q3 of 2021, um, there are construction engineering contra uh, companies that are awarded contracts for the um, site preparation of, of the LNG. Um, we also see construction in engineering companies being awarded contracts for supplies of, of cement and concrete for, for, for the project, as, uh, uh, and also did, did highlight the LNG plant uh, construction. Uh, the second stream of activities um, include the nearshore near shore projects. So um, earlier this year, it was announced that uh, for the construction of the material offloading facility, we're talking about a contract of around $365 million. It was awarded to a joint venture between uh, a Portuguese construction engineering company that does have a massive footprint and track record in Mozambique, as well as a Belgium company. Um, that, that is entering into the market. So that has been awarded, and obviously due to complexities emerging from the pandemic and uh, the insurgency situation, uh, the timelines for the execution of works have been impacted uh, quite a bit, but we do see that uh, these companies are positioning themselves uh, to do the works. Um, we, ha we have also seen announcements of contracts being awarded for the construction of the jetty, as well as uh, the temporary uh, beach landing facility near shore. And uh, we also do see other companies entering to the market to supply goods and services to, to these particular projects, such as supplies of steel structures, um, and, and, and they are quite, quite active here in the market. And thirdly, we do have um, the offshore projects. So the activities in this, in this stream of activity and, and the projects is likely to be postponed to around 2022, because uh, originally it was scheduled to happen around 2021. So, so the offshore portion of this um, includes activities such as uh, the development of the subsea system. So the contract was originally awarded um, around um, the end of 2018. There was quite a major announcement of the contract being awarded to uh, Technip and Vanoid uh, for around uh, uh, over a over billion dollars. Um, so obviously at, at this moment, uh, as highlighted, uh, the works will be uh, likely to be postponed uh, uh, sometime around uh, 2022 as a result of that. So moving on to the next slide, this pretty much touches on um, the different scenarios that we do foresee. Obviously, you know, the world is a totally different place with um, the COVID pandemic. Um, it's really impacted the timelines of the works. Uh, we do also have a peculiar situation in Mozambique, which is the insurgency situation. But these scenarios pretty much uh, focus more from a COVID perspective. Um, so, so obviously the two scenarios that we do see is a U-shaped scenario as well as an L-shaped scenario. So initially, in the beginning of the pandemic, there was a third scenario we, we took into consideration, which was V-shaped, and I'll explain that just now. So, for, for example, a V-shaped scenario would be very short-term recession, where COVID would only cause a short-term recession, and there would be quick economic recovery um, as a result of that. Uh, the second scenario is a U-shaped scenario where we do see um, recovery that's a bit slow. So it's recovery that can start happening after two or three quarters uh, during the course of the year. And thirdly, we have the worst case scenario, which is the L-shaped scenario. Um, and this is a scenario of no recovery. Uh, 
So obviously, um, due to you, you know the, how the COVID situation has kind of transpired, the the first V-shaped scenario is pretty much out the window. Uh, COVID is um, an, an issue that uh, has, has came, come come to stay to some extent, and uh, the key variable that that is a game changer between these two scenarios is the discovery of the vaccine and also the commercialization of that. So since the pandemic did hit the globe, we have seen um, you know quite some progress on, on that, and there is news around you know the period between Q4 of 2020 and also um, around mid 2021. We should see an acceleration of the commercialization of vaccines, and consequently, we, sh we should be seeing cases dropping drastically and a radical uptick in the confidence of governments to you know start reopening borders and also. Um, resuming economic activities across sectors. So one, one point I'd like to highlight is that uh, regardless of the, the scenarios, uh, we, we, do, we do foresee that the Mozambique LNG project and also the Coralef LNG project are, are expected to continue their, their investment and continue with their commitments to export LNG in their respective years, uh, regardless of the different scenarios. So we as an institution are more inclined to, to the U-shaped scenario. We do believe that there will be um, eventual uh, recovery from that uh, for two for two particular reasons. Uh, the first reason being the fact that um, over time the government has, has also relaxed uh, co uh, um, constrained measures in Mozambique for for COVID. Uh, we have seen that certain sectors that were initially uh, restricted quite drastically have been qu quite relaxed. Uh, we're seeing an uptick in economic activity. But despite that, uh, originally we did we, we did foresee prior to COVID that the economy would grow in terms of real GDP of, of levels around four um, percent year in year, and that view was dropped basically to um, a bit above um, minus one uh, percent. So we're talking about minus uh, zero point six percent of GDP growth year in year. So, so in a nutshell, um, the U-shaped scenario is the one we're more inclined to. We're not really of the view that um, there will be no economic activity long term. And the second point is um, looking from a global perspective, uh, the LNG projects. You know, the fact that the two projects that I did highlight are, are decided to resume their investment um, is also due to the fact that these are long-term investments. Um, it's money being put into the country with the, with the long-term view of the sector. So our view as an institution is that... Um, the the you know as a re, as a result of of covid uh, there have been short term capital spending cuts as a result uh so so in the long term what we do foresee is that as uh, vaccines do get re, uh, d discovered and commercialized and as we do see governments across the globe um to to relax measures and start to resume economic activity we're going to see demand for oil and gas to really start picking up globally what's going to eventually happen is that when the demand do get to pre-covid levels and do continue to rise uh, the actual supply of oil and gas worldwide will be lower than what the initial outlook was. So that means that there could be, at some point in, in the medium term, uh, uh, quite a high spike of prices, because it might be a mismatch between uh, demand globally and also the actual supply. And um, obviously, when that does happen, um, uh, I assume it would be quite appetizing for a lot of the oil companies to um, make investment and expansion decisions on that. So that's pretty much our view in a nutshell. And uh, the last slide does give an overview of, um, you know, some of the sectors where we do foresee a lot of opportunities. So obviously, um, on the ground, there are massive opportunities for construction engineering companies. And consequently, the suppliers of... Um, you know, logistics companies, suppliers of cement and, and all the inputs for production of concrete, uh, the query companies and, and, and con con companies of the like um, are seeing a lot of opportunities on the ground. So uh, for any nitty gritty uh, details you'd like in terms of opportunities on the value chain, uh, do feel free to touch base with myself and um, we, we can look at and see how we can support with that. So I'll pass the ball back over to Ivania. Uh, excellent. Thank, Thank you, you uh, Hermano. Thank you very much. Um, that was very interesting, really. And I think um, 
very insightful. So I think we are uh, ready for Q&A session and we have uh, a lot of interesting questions. Uh, thank you very much for submitting these questions. And um, maybe um, we will start from this one and probably this is a question uh, for you, Mohammed. Uh, let me pick it. Um, uh, this is a question. Uh, with new refineries coming up uh, in Middle East, or what does it mean um, to the importers in Africa, Mohammed? So the two new refineries which are uh, set to open, uh, one in uh, Jizan, which is the beginning of 2021, and then uh, th which is in Saudi, Saudi Arabia, and the other one in Dukum in Oman. And that is, that is uh, stated to start, I think, around 2022, beginning of 2022. So this would really actually bring about a change in the flows of economics which we currently have. So for example, we know for a fact that uh, Jizan will be producing around 210,000 uh, barrels per day of uh, gas oil along with uh, uh, 10,000 barrels per day gasoline and also uh, a, a bit of uh, NAFTA as well. But uh, so once it does come into uh, uh, full uh, full force, which is expected to be the first quarter of 2021, a lot of uh, African countries would basically look into export from them instead of uh, the far off uh, suppliers, say India or even China as well. And also when Dukum comes into picture, uh, which for now we know that it is going to uh, we're going to process around 230,000 barrels of crude every day. Uh, so it will really help uh, the Africa importers to switch on from the longer-ranged uh, 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 suppliers like China and even for, a, for, uh, for instance, Europe as well. So they can clearly move on to the closer uh, um, uh, suppliers and that will help them to reduce their costs uh, in terms of the freight rates for sure. And uh, right now, as we know, Middle East just uh, catered to uh, to to the East African uh, East and South, East African countries. But uh, with these two refineries com coming into picture, I'm sure even the West uh, countries in Africa would uh, would fairly be in in in. Uh, in perspective of uh, supplies for uh, Saudi and uh, for Oman. So keeping everything uh, uh, constant, it's a win-win situation for both, uh, say, the Middle East uh, producers and as well as uh, the African importers. But again, the question um, here is how how the impact of COVID would really, uh, how long it would last. So that would also play a very important role to see how the improvement or strengthening of uh, oil products uh, takes uh, happens in the market and that would also play an important role going forward. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and I think um, uh, in our Q&A box, we can see a lot of question, uh, questions, obviously, about Mozambique. There is so much interest, really, about this um, LNG uh, projects in the region. So probably uh, we really need to pick at least one, two questions about this um, uh, projects and market. So a question to you, Hermano, uh, for you and Hermano. Uh, what is your view on the insurgency situation and the impact on the projects, please? Yes, that's that's um, that's a million dollar question and an issue we've been following very closely. Uh, so one thing I'd like to really highlight is, um, you know, as a lender of the project, we we do really appreciate and have confidence in, you know, the sponsors' transparency on um, how they are mitigating the situation. Because initially we did see that, you know, the villages around 60 kilometers, there's one around 60 kilometers and another around 200 kilometers away from the project. Uh, so the closest one I'm referring to, Msima da Praia, uh, there, were, there were a lot of um, headlines on how, you know, these these villages were captured by the insurgents. There were massive killings and uh, hundreds of thousands of people, you know, running to nearby provinces. So uh, the initial view was that, um, you know, the, the, it was clear that the actual project was not, was not the target for that. Um, secondly, our view is that 
Um, the actual sponsors are quite resilient. Uh, we've seen them operate in other very challenging markets, very tough markets. Uh, we're talking about Western African markets such as Nigeria and also mid Middle Eastern markets. And um, we have also noticed that there have been uh, quite significant efforts in terms of strengthening uh, the security task force um, in order to, to, to handle that and also strengthen the actual security infrastructure in the project in a way that, you know, keeps the project safe. So I've also been um, watching closely the, you know, the progress of the works being done on site. And uh, the people that I do talk to do say that they continue to do their works as usual, and they do also have the same confidence and in, in, um, the sponsor's ability to provide uh, security for that. However, one, one, one uh, complication that we do see is pretty much on the logistics side of things, because that has really impacted the routes, uh, the logistics routes for transports of goods and services onto, onto site. So as a result of that, um, in, instead of transporting via road freight directly to the site, um, a lot of suppliers have resorted to using, um, you know, the, the port of Pemba uh, to the um, offloading facility in, in Palma. So we have seen, we have seen an uptick in uh, barge services to transport via via um, ocean freight, and um, obviously that's a, a temporarily a lucrative business. We're even seeing some companies form a joint venture with logistics companies to provide barging services because um, that's quite lucrative at the moment. So on one hand, it's made transportation a bit costly. And secondly, it's also impacted uh, the timing because it, it takes a bit of time, you know, to transport goods up and down because uh, there, there, there's a bit of a process on that. So in terms of um, the actual project being at risk, um, we do have confidence that uh, the security will be very well mitigated. Uh, at the end of the day, our institution has put a significant amount of capital to that, and our commitment does remain. And there's been no signs of any pushbacks on, on, on that, which is, which is quite a positive sign. I think uh, I think uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. The, the main question, the main question uh, that that we probably receive because there is there are so many companies entering this market now is how to be successful. Yeah, in, in these projects and there are so many factors you really need to, um, to understand and the local reality. So the question that we got from the audience was, uh, which strategy do you recommend for international companies who want to enter the Mozambican LNG market and partner with local? company so how to be successful basically yeah what you could recommend uh, uh, being local yeah and knowing all this reality <laughs> yes yes sure um so 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 there are there are quite a, a number a number of things they can do so for example uh the men, depending on the, the the size of the contracts you want to land one good strategy that that we're seeing is um the formation of partnerships with local entities so what happens is uh, the petroleum law that was established in 2004, um, if, if my memory doesn't fail me, it's around Article 38 of that particular law. It does state that um, any company, uh, any local company that can provide goods and services at international standards must be given preference, provided that the price isn't above 10 percent of um, international prices, including VAT. So that so if you partner with an international with the local shareholder rather, according to Mozambican law, if the shareholder does have at least fifty one percent stake, that would qualify them as a local company. Um, that would that would automatically put you as an advantage. So that would be a pretty much a partnership where the local entity benefits from, um, you know, the the international company's expertise and experience and also connection with suppliers and, and all that. And on the other hand, the international company will benefit from, you know, the network and the fact that the entity is Mozambican and by law they must be prioritized. So I guess that that's one of the, the, the very key strategies. Um, and also one of the, some of the other um, include, you know, the need for, for certifications. Uh, so with regards to certifications, we do also have partners with different uh, entities that do provide the certifications, as well as the entities that also, um, you know, develop the infrastructure for certifications and partner with the government for that. And obviously, on, on, in terms of uh, the strategy, there are also um, key points uh, on, on how you can set up your entity so that you can benefit from a ta tax perspective. Um, we can pretty much advise on a regulatory perspective how you could be an advantage, and from a tax perspective, perspective, we can um, introduce you to, you know, different consultants that can give you very good opinions and how, you know, you can benefit from that perspective as well. Thank you.
Thank you. Wonderful. Um, I think we also have a question for, um, I think it sounds like a question for Mohammed. So, Mohammed, if you could please answer, why has NAFTA done better than the other products in the market? It, I think it was this year or previous year. I think this year, probably, yeah? <laughs> so far. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it is for this year for sure. So there are a few reasons for this. Uh, so NAFTA, as we know, because of the COVID uh, situation, NAFTA is usually used for uh, a lot of um, uh, the protection, uh, personal protection equipment. Uh, the petrochemical sector had uh, a lot of uh, demand once uh, the pandemic actually came into uh, came to the world and boosted uh, both uh, uh, PPE requirements, uh, sanitizers, gloves, face masks, just to name a few. So as the demand picked up, NAFTA, which is one of the uh, raw materials used to prepare or manufacture uh, these uh, equipments, uh, was supported uh, majorly. And uh, and lately, we can see that the cracks, as, as I did speak in my uh, presentation, um, have been on the higher side for, compared to the last five years because the unprecedented demand, which has increased from across the globe, did uh, push the, or strengthen the uh, NAFTA market and NAFTA prices. And also, uh, NAFTA, which is uh, uh, in different way grades, like uh, heavy, and also you uh, you get uh, light high paraffinic naphtha as well so which is more or less uh, feasible to use uh, for the refining and refi petrochemical sector they usually prefer using the high paraffinic naphtha so the demand specifically for high paraffinic naphtha uh, increased and the supply wasn't uh, as wasn't available in the market because not not uh, not everybody uh, pre uh, produces this high paraffinic naphtha. One of the major uh, uh, exporters, I must say, is uh, UAE in the, from from the region. But since the supply was on the lower side, this kind of uh, helped uh, or supported naphtha further. And also another reason uh, of late is uh, th the run cuts. So because the middle distillates have been performing so bad of lately. Uh, the margins aren't there right now for, for middle distillates. So a lot of these refineries are uh, uh, cutting on their run rates. So when, when, when they do this, it uh, directly affects on the uh, NAFTA production as well. So again, the supply kind of goes down and this again pushes the NAFTA prices uh, in the market because there is a demand for NAFTA, but the supply is not uh, as much. And, and the final point I would like to add here is uh, LPG uh, also, which is used as a feedstock for uh, manufacturing by the petrochemical sector, has fairly uh, been higher uh, compared to the, the other uh, uh, products. Um, few reasons for this is as there was locked out, people were forced to stay home and use uh, and burn a lot of uh, gases for their, uh, uh, I say, kitchen purpose or even for heating purpose. So this kind of uh, kept uh, uh, LPG prices uh, on, on the higher scale as well. And since there wasn't uh, much of a difference in terms of uh, uh, NAFTA and LPG prices, so usually there are spread difference of around $50 when LPG becomes uh, a better uh, feedstock to use instead of NAFTA. But uh, since the spread wasn't really there, uh, a lot of... Uh, petrochemical sector participants wanted to stick with NAFTA instead of move to the other feedstocks. And this, that again brought about the increase in demand, which again supported the prices constantly in the market. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, before we end the session, I really want to ask this question, and this is a question for Hermano. I think you've mentioned this a bit, uh, you covered this a bit in your slides, but uh, Hermano, how do you uh, see uh, the LNG projects uh, impacting Mozambique economically? Yes, thank, thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks once again, Ivania. Um, so, uh, during the presentation, I did briefly share on, you know, how our economic outlook for Mozambique has changed over the years. Uh, so we've seen, one of the things that we've seen is, um, number one, 
Um, in terms of economic impact, LNG projects will continue to have, um, in the short term, um, a quite uh, a ne a ne negative pressure on the current account balance of the economy. Why do I say that? Um, it's the fact that Mozambique economy. So obviously, with the with the development, there's high demand for construction, engineering, and the value chain that comes with that. So as a result, since we're not an industrialized economy, there's going to be a lot of imports of, um, you know, the of material and equipment for for construction. So our initial view prior to COVID was that you know the current account balance would be pushed up to levels around forty percent of GDP and even exceed that during the development phase, but um, due to COVID. The demand um, uh, for the for those inputs in the value chain have been reduced, so uh, current account balance will be around um, thirty something percent of, of GDP. So that's one point. Uh, the second point in terms of economic growth, um, I did highlight that uh, the economic growth GDP. Uh, year and year growth were, was initially around uh, four four percent, which was our original outlook, increase of minus zero point six percent. Uh, in terms of real GDP uh, year and year, um, had it not been for the for the LNG projects, our view would have been that that would actually be worse, and that's because um, you know al although you know a lot of um, companies that wanted to invest into the country have, have pushed back, and that has impacted the FDI of the economy, which is a foreign direct investment. Uh, the LNG project continues to have a positive impact on, on FDI. And obviously, as a result, there is there is some degree of multiplier effect. We're seeing a lot of um, Mozambican SMEs having opportunities, especially for the smaller contracts uh, within the value chain and, and opportunities emerging. So in a nutshell, um, I still say that um, the, the LNG project uh, impacting the economy is more good than bad in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think um, this uh, brings us to the end of this webinar. And uh, once again, uh, I want to uh, say uh, and basically uh, um, repeat what, what I said in the very beginning that uh, all the recording and slide decks uh, will be shared with you after the webinar. Uh, and you will also see a pop-up window with a short survey. We'd be grateful if you could provide your feedback and complete this survey. And let me again uh, thank our speakers for sharing their insights and all attendees for participation in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you.